March 1st, 2022, uh, sorry, <clears throat> March 1st, 2023 meeting of the Seattle City Council's Public Assets and Homelessness Committee will come to order. It is 2 p.m. I am Andrew Lewis, Chair of the Committee. Vice Chair Mosqueda is excused from today's meeting. Will the Committee Clerk please call the roll? Council Member Herbold. Here. Council President Juarez. Here. Council Member Morales. Here. Chair Lewis. Present. Chair, there are four members present. Approval of the agenda. If there's no objection, the agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the agenda is adopted. Chair's report. Uh, today, we're only going to have one agenda item, um, although it is going to be a big and very important agenda item, a report back on the co-lead Just Care Outcomes, Conditions for Success and Impact. The materials for that presentation have been distributed, including the report completed by <laughs> Dr. Catherine Beckett at the University of Washington. Um, so very much looking forward to jumping in um, to that uh, item of today's business. Uh, moving forward to public comment, um, folks who want to uh, comment on today's agenda can now um, do so. I'm gonna go ahead and set the public speaking time at one minute and uh, uh, people know the remote versus in-person rules. Uh, why don't we start with the remote public comment period and the public comment period will be moderated um, uh, by the committee clerk. Uh, so let's take the remote folks first, and then um, we will go through everybody in council chambers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our first remote public commenter is George Scarola. George, you'll need to press star six, and then you'll have one minute to speak. Hello. Hi, George. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Great. My name's George Stoll. I'm speaking as an individual. Here, George, I you I can't really hear you. Can you speak a little louder there, please? Um, my name is George Scarola. I'm speaking as an individual today. I want to tell a story about a guy I met at my gym south of Seattle. He has a pair of pliers tattooed on his calf. I asked him why. He's a plumber, he says, and he's a happy plumber. He's making $100,000 a year. We got to talking and later he asked me what I do. I said, I do homelessness. And he told me the story of his life. He's been living, had been living on the streets of Seattle in and out for years, in and out of King County Jail, in and out of shelters. And he asked me, have I ever heard of a program called LEAD? said, yeah, lead saved my life. Thank you, George. Our next caller is Jake Alper. Jake, please press star six, and then you'll have one minute to give public comment. Hi, my name is Jake Alper. Um, I just want to share that as a West Seattle homeowner, I've been horrified to learn of the increase in threats and violence directed at my neighbors living in RVs. Uh, recently, several of our neighbors received a threatening letter followed by dumping of suspicious materials and gunshots in the area of their homes. This isn't surprising given that the city knows bias crimes against unhoused neighbors increased 229% uh, last year. These neighbors deserve respect and safety as much as any homeowner. The city's only response has been sweep, driving them to new areas to be threatened by different house neighbors. This is appalling and pointless. Where is the safe RV lot? What is Seattle doing other than trying to hide visible homelessness to protect the comfort of house people? I think you can all do better, and I think we can all do better. Thank you, Jake. We will now move to in-person public comment. Our first in-person public commenter is Jesse Burleson. Jesse, please approach the microphone. And following Jesse, we'll have Sandy Ruffin. Uh, both should work. Good evening. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Jesse Burleson. I'm here. 
to bring awareness to the fact that violence is being perpetrated against the homeless in a most rampant rate. Uh, last Monday, I received this letter on the windshield of my RV. I'd like to read it to the council if I may. Dear friend, I am sincerely sorry you are in the position you are in. However, this is not a good place for you to park and live, even temporarily. When the first lot of RVs showed up here last year, it brought the neighborhood together. Our kids are scared. Our wives were harassed. Some of you are sex offenders, drug dealers, or addicts. All of you make a mess. Everyone here has handled this differently. Some file reports, some complain to the mayor, but now we are fed up and some people are ready to make your life sheer hell and will damage you longer keep you warm or be drivable. They are ready and looking to fight. This will happen likely soon. You have been warned. I am a military veteran. This is a declaration of war. I have seen war. War is an ugly thing. Where is our freaking safe lot? I'm priced out and I can't afford to pay rent in this town. I had people come by off of me housing yesterday, told me, we'll help you with the move in costs. Well, that's well and fine, but if you can't afford the rent to begin with, you're setting me up for failure. Sir, your time has expired. I'm sorry. But if you want to connect after the council meeting today, I'd be interested in learning more. Seriously, please. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, uh, there's apparently an issue with the public speaking mics um, being picked up for the council members appearing remotely. Um, I'm sorry, could, could, would you try speaking into the other microphone? Is that working? Hassan, is that working? Uh, we're not getting anything. Can you confirm that the podium mics are enabled on the Crest Track controller? Yeah, IT thinks that the mic's not be might not. How's that? Maybe it was because I had my mask on. There we go. Now oh, we can hear. Okay, so it, it it sounds like IT it was um because the speaker was wearing a mask, so okay. it sounds like the thank mics you. are operating okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, no objection to letting the speaker speak again since council members could not hear his um, comments. Um, so go ahead, please. You you have one more minute. Okay. Dear friend, I am sincerely sorry you are position you are in. However, this is not a good place for you to live, even temporarily. When the first lot of RVs showed up here last year, it brought a neighborhood together. Our kids are scared. Our wives are harassed. Some of you are sex offenders, drug dealers, or addicts. All of you make a mess. Everyone here has handled it differently. Some file reports, some complain to the mayor, but now we are fed up and some people are ready to make your life sheer hell and will damage your vehicles so they will no longer keep you warm or be drivable. They are ready and looking to fight. This will happen likely soon. You have been warned. I take this as a declaration of war. And as a military veteran, I know about war. I've seen killing. And if you people don't do something to get us someplace safe to park, that's exactly what's gonna happen. Somebody's gonna get killed. Maybe even an innocent child. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Our next speaker is Sandy Ruffin. After Sandy, we'll have Chanel Horner. Hello. Um, I am one of Jesse's house neighbors, and I just wanna say I've seen the letters, I've seen guns shot near their RVs to scare them. I've seen people dump trash and do much, much worse to their homes. And these people deserve a safe lot. Lifetime Seattle residents who are priced out, most of them working full time or some have medical emergencies and can't pay their bills. Good neighbors, better neighbors than some of my house neighbors. And they're having to deal with this. Where's the RV safe lot? Who's taking care of them? Who's going to keep them safe when neighbors decide to do worse in the middle of the night? Um, and for council members who may not have heard um, Jesse speak the first time, that those letters were left on multiple RVs in one neighborhood and then followed up with a lot of action going from annoying to threatening. So um, thank you for your time. It's an RV lot. Thank you, Sandy. Next is Chanel Horner, followed by Celine Russo. Good 
Hello, um, my name is Chanel Horner, and I've been going to KCRHA meetings as a lived experience <clears throat> person living in an RV and or living in my bus for over a year now. And um, I know that Lehigh is responsible for finding the RV lot, but I think the city could do a lot if they help uh, donate property because right now at this point, we've been waiting since last March. I think they had they got approved last March, I, I believe, and they had a lot of money. I mean, they got a lot of freaking money to, to build this lot and we have nowhere to park. And we got all these blocks everywhere and nobody's done shit about, sorry, but uh, the blocks need to be, uh, somebody needs to be fined for these blocks. I mean, they're taking up all our parking spot. If we don't have a place to park and you guys are pushing us out of, out of the industrial area into the neighborhoods, Things like this happen in the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods don't want to park. We don't want to park next to these businesses. We don't want to park in these streets or causeways. We want to park somewhere where we're allowed. And, and it's not really fair that Lehigh hasn't gotten that place yet. Bellevue's going to open a new park in, in, in another month. It's all because Bellevue donated property. If we donated property, we'd have a place now. Thank you, Chanel. Our next public commenter is Celine Russo, followed by Alex Zimmerman. All right. Um, as a West Seattle homeowner, I feel neither threatened or harassed by Jesse, but I am disgusted by that letter. I'm extremely disappointed in the city's response of sweeps with no support. This forces people to move every few weeks and face threats in a different location. This policy of sweeps is not only cruel and inhumane, but dangerous. When the city lies to house residents that services and housing are being offered, which they are not, the city is encouraging vigilante justice and violence against our RV and tent neighbors. These threats are increasing and they dovetail with the violence already inherent in living outside. Why is the city spending $38 million on sweeps and a $2 million grant for an RV safe lot sits unused? The city declared a homeless emergency quote 10 years ago in Seattle and we can't even get one safe lot built. I love the suggestion of donating property. Like the city can do something at this point. Um, we need to get it done now. We can't allow this violence to continue. We cannot allow it to continue in one of the richest cities in this country. It's not okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Zimmerman followed by Ajane. Thank you. Uh, huh. Zikhail. My daughter, Nazi Gestapo killer. You kill every year 300 people, and you're not in jail. I <laughs> said, so can happen only in Seattle. Yeah. So why does this happen? Why you kill 300 homeless? Your salary $150,000. You spend for homeless $50,000 for each. One bedroom apartment costs 1000 bucks per month. It's $12,000. What is the reason spend 50000 bucks? When for $12,000, you give everybody a one bedroom apartment or studio, it don't have sense. And you're doing this business for four years. I think it's time for you need to move out because by definition, you're a criminal, a bandita, a killer. If you don't show us faces, there's another plus. So you need to be in jail. It's exactly what they talk. You all night counsel supposed to be jailed because by definition, you killer. You're supposed to be in jail. All of us, stand up, America. Clean this chamber from this bandita. Our final public commenter is Ajane. You'll have one minute. Some times in our lives, we all have pain. We all have sorrow. But if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Meaning there is always tomorrow. Meaning if you even make mistakes, regardless of your job occupation, because we are all equal in the eyes of God. We are talking about the homeless, which I talk about all the time and you are pushing them aside, we all need somebody to lean on because anything can happen. And I just hope you listen to us because we are all equal. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. That is all of our public commenters.
Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Clerk. And we'll pursue to, or uh, <clears throat> sorry, proceed to the item on our agenda, the presentation on um, lead co-lead. Um, I do want to take chair's prerogative for a moment to acknowledge the righteous frustration of the audience members over the continued failure of the city and the King County Regional Homeless Authority to establish the safe lot that the council has funded for, I think, three budgets running now. Um, and I, you know, I wish I could say more from the dais right now um, about that, but the, the extent of what I can say is just that um, this council feels that frustration keenly and we'll continue to make that funding available and we'll continue to push for our executive partners to implement that RV safe lot because it, it is an important priority and thank you for coming down here to advocate for it today. Uh, so with that, we will move to our agenda item on lead co-lead and it's great to be in a position to welcome um, Dr. Beckett back to the committee. Uh, we've previously heard um, a report on this research uh, during the preliminary um, uh, the preliminary report on Just Care a couple of years ago, uh, and then the broader panel of our partners who have brought Just Care uh, and its multiple iterations into life over the course of the pandemic um, and continue to do this work, and, and hopefully uh, will continue to do this work in a greater resourced way um, uh, as we go forward on our partnership with the KCRHA and, and other um, local leaders to make sure that we uh, take full advantage of the lessons that are within this report and presentation. So uh, who should I hand it over to first? Should I hand it over to you, Lisa Dugard, to introduce the panel and then um, introduce Dr. Beckett? Yes, that's that's the okay. plan. Thank you so much, Thanks. Chair Lewis. Um, good afternoon. It is really um, a privilege for us to be here um, with the council the Seattle City Council has been really a stalwart supporter of this work um, from early days. And in a very real sense, it would not have come to fruition and we would not have been able to sort of complete the learning arc that we're going to present today without um, very strong council intervention to make sure that the work remained alive. Um, my name is Lisa Dugard. I'm a co-executive director at PDA. Um, today actually is the very first day, um, March 1st, 2023, that our name is Purpose, Dignity, Action. We are no longer the Public Defender Association. We provide um, project management and design support for community-based alternative safety um, strategies. And as alluded to in public comment by George Storola, whose story I, I wanted to hear the end of, um, we uh, the, the origin of this work really traces back to LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, also known as Let Everyone Advance with Dignity. Uh, LEAD is a program um, now replicated around the country. I'm actually in Minneapolis right now consulting with their LEAD um, initiative that's just getting off the ground. But it was born in Seattle in 2011, and the basic idea is to provide um, wraparound case management for as long as it takes to stabilize and foster recovery um, for people who otherwise are highly likely to be engaged by the criminal legal system related to behavior that is problematic oftentimes for themselves than for other people, but relates to drug use, mental illness, or poverty. And so is, um, uh, is susceptible to strategies and solutions of community-based care rather than punishment. So LEAD provides that um, street-based case management and care coordination and, and has for the last more than a decade. In 2020, uh, we had just seen an increase, sort of a, a hard fought uh, decision by the city to step up its commitment to LEAD so that we could start taking considerably more referrals. Um, and when those funds came online, that happened to coincide really with the um, very early days of the COVID pandemic. And that was, that presented obviously, you know, comprehensive challenges for everybody in every way. But for us, um, managing lead and we had been on the cusp of building a new workforce that would um, provide this case management to many more people. 
we were presented with an immediate um, set of challenges that COLEED and Just Care ended up being the answer to. Uh, we had resources that were clearly badly needed, as you may, like if we can all go back to what it was um, in that, in the spring of 2020, summer of 2020, um, it was evident that as badly as many people had needed lead case management and flex funds before the pandemic, all the more um, so, you know, was that the case in 2020 as people who had been in shelters, those shelters were quote unquote de-intensified congregate shelters in order to prevent COVID transmission. So some people were transferred to non-congregate facilities, but many others were just turned out into the street because nobody knew what else to do and there wasn't a ready, a ready alternative. Many of the folks that we work with in LEAD already had not been welcome guests in the congregate shelter systems. So they were already outside, but now we're cut off from public spaces like libraries and community centers, and also from the behavioral health and um, physical health care system altogether. Everything was closed. And I just, you know, um, sitting where we are today, it's hard to really recall how dramatic um, the situation was. Those who had had jobs um, in the gig economy or with a W-2 were pretty, you know, pretty early on getting the message that there would be relief strategies if their jobs closed down, but people who had been making their living in the um, sort of gray economy or the illicit economy did not have those relief strategies. They did not have places to go and seek support. They did not have places to be during the day. So folks were just um, gathering out outdoors um, in large numbers and increasingly in locations that in the past had been used by other members of the public, but um, now with the shutdown were uh, largely abandoned to other uses. And so that was the situation in the summer. We had resources, but we did not have referrals to lead case management coming through um, law enforcement, which was the original model because law enforcement um, officers were themselves uh, getting sick, um, being instructed to limit their human contact in order to avoid getting sick. And there was nowhere to take people for low level offenses either because the jail booking um, criteria had been sharply reduced. Courts were effectively closed. So it was sort of, you know, us or nothing. It, it started to feel like, and we did have resources, but we knew that it wouldn't make a great deal of sense to go and offer street-based case management in the circumstances that people were living in because the systems that we had been helping folks navigate were shut. So at that same time, um, there were, you know, rumors of large amounts of COVID relief funding coming from the federal government and how those funds were going to be programmed began to be clear. And we noticed that there was not a, a clear plan to make those um, emergency relief funds reach the, po the large population of people who are extraordinarily heavily impacted by COVID um, living outdoors without relief um, sources, struggling with behavioral health conditions. And um, like others around the country, we noticed that the hotel industry was hard hit um, and that there were suddenly non-congregate facilities that potentially were available to um, house or lodge this population. So long story short, we initially um, asked for permission to make temporary use of lead funding to secure um, unused hotels and to stand up a team of intensive case managers who would support people who came inside to those facilities and then later um, first with the help of the King County Council and King County and then um, with the city of Seattle um, again with leadership from this council um, we were able to tap some COVID relief funds to keep those programs going through the spring of 2022. There were um, two objectives right that we had one was um, just to provide immediate relief for both individuals who are really stranded and in dire, dire straits. Um, and the other was, and, and sorry, relief also for neighborhoods that by the fall of 2020, we're gonna start to try to come back online um, after the economic shutdown had 
that the arc of that initial shutdown was coming to a close and really couldn't um, resume normal operations because of the intensity and um, seriousness of the conditions on the street as people were trying to live um, their full lives out in public. Um, so we're trying to secure immediate relief for folks. We were also though trying to learn something about this very unusual, really for us, unprecedented opportunity of you know what what might happen if people were given really um, dignified lodging facilities that that permitted privacy, permitted people to um, you know be able to be by themselves when that was needed for their own um, peace of mind and honestly for for others sometimes, um, if folks could be surrounded with really robust um, care teams and uh, and if we offered those resources for people who had not traditionally used the shelter system or been welcome in the shelter system. Um, the initial question was, would people accept that offer? And at that back in 2020 and in the year before, there had been a lot of discussion about quote unquote service resistant populations. Um, and there had become sort of a um, mechanical process of people would be offered congregate shelter, um, often would say no to that, and then would be swept or displaced from a location on the theory that they had turned down services. So what else you know, remains as a policy option? Um, we wanted to find out if, um, if we offered a different kind of care and a different kind of services, if there would be a different response. We are not the first, you know, to try offering non-congregate shelter and testimony um, here about how often people will accept tiny homes had given um, a strong indication that non-congregate shelter might reach a different population. Um, but we didn't really know if there was an intentional concentration on a population living in the streets that was chronically homeless facing greatest barriers and at high exposure to the criminal legal system because of specific circumstances if um, we would see a high rate of uptake. And then the other thing that we didn't know is if we did um, and if folks would um, accept that, that kind of care and level of care and support, could we force systems to make a place for them from that point on? Could we create a road to permanent housing for this population, um, as well, what kind of behavioral health stabilization and care uh, would we be able to arrange for this group of people that really is um, has been studied by King County as the familiar faces population? You know, overwhelmingly, this was a population that had been cycling through jails and courts for years um, to little avail and with little progress and a fair amount of harm and at great cost. Could we? you know, create another road that went beyond just temporary shelter. So we are really um, here today to describe uh, the approach that is taken and my colleagues, um, medical director, Sam Katarski, clinical director, Shavana Gaylor and housing manager, Crystal Erickson, will lay out um, the approach that we take, what has really proven to be um, a strength of this model, and what are the challenges that we have um, encountered um, that if, if those were addressed, um, we could see further progress. And then Dr. Beckett will present um, the most recent research that she and research colleagues completed looking at outcomes after a full arc of two years of um, this approach being up and running. And particularly my last comment, um, taking into account um, the sort of change in circumstances that we encountered in the winter and spring of 2022, when we did um, finally achieve a channel to permanent housing resources of a different um, sort than we had had in the past and what happened to our ability to place people um, in permanent housing. So turning it over now to uh, Dr. Katarski and uh, Shivana Gaylor, I think, to kick us off. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'm Dr. Singh Katarski, as Lisa said, a medical director and interim a director for the COLE program. 
my pronouns are she, her, and it is uh, really amazing to be here with you all and to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, what we've done and to have uh, Dr. Beckett here to go over what um, our, this new research is showing. So I just wanna build a little bit on what um, Lisa had said before, just to kind of frame up a little bit about co-lead and just care for anyone who may be new to us and not aware of sort of where we came from and, and what, what we are. So as Lisa said, um, LEAD has been a longstanding program, previously known law enforcement assisted diversion, let everyone advance with dignity. Um, we have some, we have a, a few acronyms here, so I will do my best to try to also just state them so that we're not assuming that everybody knows what they are. So as Lisa said, um, in 2020 as services shut down. So if you think of LEAD as a um, service provider to be able to go out into the communities, out to reach people who are living unhoused and to work with them to help them gain access to services. It, LEAD has done that for a, quite, a, quite a long time um, with, with wonderful success, um, but doing so in the field specifically and connecting people to services. So when those services had to close their doors because of the pandemic, it really left that program um, you know, in, in a bit of a lurch trying to figure out what the best way to help people would be. That is the pivot to co-lead. The, co, um, the co aspect of co and lead is to describe that COVID, it is born in COVID, but also co-responder. So, and with that shift, co-lead took the framework of, of providing services for folks, took that framework and then added to it a couple of components, um, one of which a significant one is was the lodging component that Lisa spoke about. So what would it look like if we did uh, bring people in and help stabilize them with lodging while still providing services and connecting to services? So co-lead is the backbone of just care. And so just care is, you can think of just care as the response to the felt impact in our communities um, the, of people living in encampments and some of the, um, the, the realities of what we felt in our communities um, by our, our neighbors, our businesses, uh, of people living unsheltered, struggling to live in conditions that were frankly not fit for humans to be living in um, and experiencing significant, um, sometimes significant unmet mental health need um, or untreated substance use disorder um, and sort of some of the behavioral effects that can come out of that. So we can't really talk about just care without really talking about a, one of the key components, which actually starts right at the beginning, which is outreach. So a really core component is our outreach teams go into the field and do the field work in order to, which means going out, finding people who are experiencing homelessness, often in encampments, and meeting the people exactly where they are and taking weeks to get to know them. So a key component here is that co-lead and just care is a relationship-based model. We meet people. We learn where they are, what they are going through, what they have been experiencing, and we build relationships with them. And the reason that this is so important is because when working with people who have been experiencing chronic homelessness, who are having challenges, they may have criminal legal system involvement, um, they may have physical or mental health issues that have um where they have experienced uh, difficulty trying to even access services. We know that there are many barriers that people face. Um, there are many barriers that people face accessing these services across our nation, especially within our healthcare system. Adding into that, um, living unsheltered un with that instability, oftentimes issues with not having identification, not ha not knowing or having your health insurance, these types of barriers can really limit any access that somebody would have to seek any type of help. So with such levels of rejection and living in environments that oftentimes people have pretty significant trauma history, I think it's an understatement to say that many people are 
hesitant to have the conversation with somebody coming to them and offering them something, uh, whether that's offering services or, you know, asking them if they want to become a program. And so as a result of that, you know, a lot of the people that we work with have been labeled as resistant or labeled as unwanting of services or unwanting. And in reality, I, we, that's not what we have found. We have not found that people are unwanting or resistant. We have found that when we work with them and we get to know them for the people that they are, and we think about, we hear what they need, and we think about what we can do to individualize and find a good match for them, find a match when it comes to um, a type of lodging or resource that we can bring to them, what they need in order to meet their identified goals. When we do that and provide that dignity, people say yes, they say yes. And as we'll see with the research, it really does help. Um, when we look when we look at the over our, the path all the way from our outreach to the permanent housing that we'll talk about in a bit. So. After outreach and that match is made, we are able to then um, bring people inside into, as I've said, uh, te temporary lodging, but temporary lodging that's designed to really provide them with, with dignity um, and be less of a, a congregate type of shelter. And while they're there, that stabilization of having that lodging allows case managers to provide intensive case management support. And that is some of the things I've described, helping people navigate if they have um, legal system involvement that they need help with, if they uh, don't have IDs and they need to get their IDs in order, you, you, know, you can't do much without your identification. Um, it's one of the first things that's going to be asked for pretty much any service that you're about to try to do or try to get housing, a job, anything of that type, you need that ID. Um, activating healthcare and getting their insurance going, addressing any acute needs. Um, acute health care needs. It's not an easy system to be able to sign up for health insurance, and it can really sometimes take some support and help with navigating that system. And when people have health insurance, they are then able to start utilizing health care services that actually fit their need and not relying on the emergency room to meet their primary health care needs. We also have found that when people come inside and they experience the stabilization of, of, of being inside and having case management support and having their basic needs met, shelter, food, water, that they are able to then take a breath and start identifying their own goals. And we all know that the fastest way for people to identify goals and meet change is in, through intrinsic motivation. It's when it's something that we want. And when we do that with our participants, when we when they set their goals and meet their goals, we what we have found is that they can meet them at such a rapid rate. We're able to do things so much more quickly than we even thought and allow them uh, to then continue forward. And nearly, every, I mean, everybody, everyone who comes in, every participant essentially does have a goal of permanent housing. So, and also as one of their goals, getting to permanent housing, us trying to do that. Um, so as I said, uh, some of the some of the difficulties that we face, some of the barriers that our participants face, um, we definitely have experienced um, some significant challenges when it comes to accessing, as I mentioned, uh, physical health care services or primary care, but also behavioral health, uh, including services for substance use disorder. And I'm actually going to let our clinical director. Uh, Shivana Gaylor speak to that. Shivana. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam and Lisa. Um, I am so honored to be here, you all. And one of the most encouraging aspects of being here today was hearing the community express their, um, their passion, their concerns, but from a place of humanity and care. As we're looking at it, as you see, we have our expertise, our compassion, our clinical skills, our community response, all come together to be able to really deliver a comprehensive strategy to everyone who is in need, to our individuals who are in need, who are our most vulnerable in our society from a place of humanity. And to hear that in the, the participant, the, the community members was very encouraging. 
So when we're looking at the overall dynamics, we can't ignore, as Dr. Sam was mentioning, the significant mental health and substance use challenges that our population is facing. And when we look at that substance use, especially as a coping strategy, albeit um, maladaptive, we have to see how it's such a multi-layer challenge for people, um, for our population, as well as for the community. Yes, it is difficult. However, it requires navigation of access to and availability of needed services. And that's our significant barrier that we're facing. We can have the expertise. We can, we will always come from a space of compassion, humanity, and dignity. Um, and then we will continue to build and grow in our clinical skills, being person-centered, looking at harm reduction, um, being trauma-informed in the way that we interact with every individual that we face, whether they are served through us or we're, we're the ones providing linkage to them to another organization. However, the challenge that we find sometimes is that coordination and collaboration with finding the efficient services that, we, that they need. Um, oftentimes we hear that if, if we just need to put everybody in treatment, right? They just need treatment. However, inpatient substance use services can be weeks if not months out. So when you have an individual who is vulnerable, who is struggling, and who has identified that maybe I am willing, although substance use has um, been a way that I've been able to survive emotionally, mentally through significant layers of behavioral, mental health, and trauma um, over the years, I may be receptive to considering what, what does a different life look like or reconnecting to who I was or who I desire to be when there's not readily available that service to say, okay, where is it? Wait, wait, okay, you're ready. Let's wait about a few weeks or a few months. That is a significant barrier to, barrier to us meeting those needs. So we absolutely need to consider how do we um, make our, build the volume of our services and our resources available to address the underlying circumstances that may be contributing to where we are at this point. Um, additionally, we look at, some of the other challenges that we may face as far as crisis response. Oftentimes the crisis response that we need tends to be that behavioral health support and the access to those services are limited, significantly limited. Um, for example, we recently had an individual who we have been able to offer comprehensive support to and she was having a, a, a significant decline and was struggling and we needed support in what she needed was mental health stabilization. However, access to those services were not readily available. So what ended up happening did not ultimately meet her need. Did we buffer that with our level of humanity and care coordination and, and, and our wrapping around her? Yes, however, there still is the outstanding need for her mental health stabilization. And that is a big barrier that we face. When we look at, in addition, substance use tends to be a significant barrier to housing which Crystal is gonna to talk to us about all of the hard work that's put into housing. We also have to look at it, substance use as a disqualifier for housing. We know that relapse rates are incredibly high for all individuals, but especially high for those unsheltered. So what does that look like when we are dealing with multiple layers of substance use and mental health needs that are underlying um, and we're seeking to eliminate the barriers to, to that stabilization for the individual and we can ultimately get them into services and or into housing and look at that approach. However, if substance being um, not using substances is a barrier to being able to be housed, and we know that relapse is a part of that recovery process, how do we build in that humanity with all of the layers and all the services and the linkages to be able to look, in, look at all of our services from that harm reduction modality? Um, and from that place of compassion and care and all of those pillars that we stand for, making sure that we model and also teach and train and provide that as a linkage to others as well. The, the additional options, like I said, looking at housing, which Crystal is gonna help us with, when we look at our transitional housing while wrapping around individuals, what we provide is temporary housing with the additional services so that we can guide them into that next area of stabilization. I want to turn it back over to Dr. Sin and, and make sure there's no areas that I may have missed. And then we can definitely dive into how Crystal is able to utilize that, that component of, of the process. We have the process of outreach, then we comprehensive with 
always in that comparing, care and compassion wrapping around with our case management services would ultimately leading to long-term stabilization through housing and consistent services that will eliminate a lot of those barriers and provide the support that's needed for ongoing, um, for ongoing joy, ultimately, for ongoing restoration and healing. Dr. Sin? Thank you so much, Shivana. Um, and yeah, I just wanna emphasize the points that you made. So, you know, we say barrier a lot when we're talking about people living unsheltered and, you know, attempting to either go into some sort of shelter, transitional shelter, uh, or into permanent housing. And, you know, in some cases, substance use or um, previous or current criminal legal system involvement, they are a frank, they're a ban. It's a ban. And that's what people are facing, that they cannot access, they cannot get in, they cannot take those steps um, with an outright ban um, for things that, that, you know, that don't allow any level of um, recourse or individual consideration. And so I just want to state that for Coley Just Care, we really look at the individual. We look at, you know, their history, where they are now, um, what they're experiencing, and we don't ban. We take all of that into consideration to figure out what's going to work best for someone. And that has worked incredibly well for us. And I also just want to name that as we then, for us in our, our lodging, our temporary lodging sites and our program, um, but as we then move people into permanent housing situations, we still experience some of that barrier, some of that banning. And with that, um, I would like to turn this over to Crystal Erickson um, our, regarding the housing components. Crystal? Crystal, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Crystal Erickson. I'm the housing manager for CoLead um, PD, through PDA. And I'm thankful to be here today as well to just talk with you guys about what housing has looked like for our program um, and some of the challenges we've had, but also just some of, you know, just the successes that we've had as well. Um, so traditional access to housing um, has been normally through coordinated entry, having to go and take an assessment and just wait, wait months up to a year for a resource um, or access resources that may not be a good fit um, for a particular individual who's unhoused. And um, what has really been a game changer for our program has been um, access to housing um, with our direct partnerships um, and resource access um, to permanent supportive housing, to Section 8 vouchers um, and whatnot. So um, when we do have those options, we have more um, success with housing participants. Um, so in the early part of 2020, um, or no, and during 2020 and the early part of 2021, we had very limited resources for housing. Um, like I explained, it was very difficult to get folks connected to any resources. And that was one of their number one goals was they wanted permanent housing. Um, and then in the early part of, uh, so I think it was about September 21, um, we got access to emergency housing vouchers through Section 8, and that really like opened doors for our participants. It was a huge game changer. Um, we were able to uh, connect with participants to see, um, you know, if that would be a good fit for them by, you know, assessing their housing needs. Um, keeping it very housing first centered um, to what what would be a good fit for them, try not and looking at places so they were not further displaced um, away from their community and their um, access to services. So we were able to use that resource. And then um, 
in the spring of 2022 um, or 2021, we got access to um, permanent supportive housing resources with a direct partnership with KCRHA, which also was a huge game changer for our folks. Um, and they were very receptive to um, going into um, housing and having different housing options. Um, we also are providing um, care after folks are housed, which is very helpful. Um, and yeah, it's, that's where, that's what we've been doing where we're at. Go ahead, Lisa. I'm just gonna wrap up the um, PDA co-lead presentation and we'll turn it over to Dr. Beckett. Um, Fed, do you wanna pop up uh, the pink slide? <laughs> Thank you. Just to, um, to provide a graphic demonstration of just how profound the barriers um, were in the population that we found in the uh, encampment sites where we worked in Pioneer Square, the Chinatown International District and the downtown core over those two years. You can see that um, the vast majority of folks that we encountered um, were met the definition of chronically homeless and a very significant um, minority, just under 40% had been for homeless for over five years. Um, almost everybody had been homeless for over a year and was in that um, in that way, not the definition of chronically homeless. So what that means is that these are folks who are um, being rejected by, not being engaged by and not sustained with existing um, structures of care, right? So this is a population with um, demonstrated unmet needs. And then in terms of the clinical characteristics and barriers faced um, by that population, the yellow bars there show you um, just how pervasive um, self-described substance use uh, issues are. Almost everybody that we have welcomed inside at COLEAD comes in with um, diagnosable substance use disorder. Um, other mental health issues as well, profound trauma history, um, the existing uh, serious legal barriers, warrants, pending cases, um, and criminal history barriers that are posing impediments to um, various kinds of support and solutions. Um, people just not having identification and big barriers to getting identification. Um, so this is what my colleagues have described, but you sort of see it summed up here. If you go to the blue slide, Beth, you'll see we worked with um, 500 people, a little bit more than 500 people over these two years. Those were folks engaged, um, including the small number of people who did not or could not come into COLEAD because their medical needs um, exceeded our ability to meet them or mental health status exceeded our ability to safely house people. That was not a large number, um, but there is a population that is, um, as the court system says, needs exceeds for, um, for co-lead. Almost 70% um, of those who um, were engaged in the um, encampments we worked at were BIPOC and those who were offered and those who accepted co-lead resources were more so. Um, the map shows the 14 encampments that we fully were able to resolve. And I just wanna put um, a, a really clear description around encampment resolution through the Just Care um, framework. Uh, it was intentionally organized as an alternative to sweeps, an alternative to displacement, an alternative to enforcement. And it was um, convened in response to neighborhoods plea for decisive action to improve the um, order, safety, and um, health issues in neighborhoods, but without import using enforcement and without using dispersal and sweeps. So that's a reasonable request. There should be something besides those two strategies, and we aimed to fill that gap. Um, in particular, there was a really lovely, um, compelling letter by pretty much every organization in the Chinatown International District um, in the summer of 2020, pleading for 
a strategy to address the public order issues in the neighborhood, but asking that people not be either um, arrested, jailed, or dispersed um, elsewhere in the neighborhood or to adjacent neighborhoods. So these were um, the locations where we set out to fully resolve um, an encampment, sometimes more than once, uh, without, um, without dis displacing anyone. And that means very simply having a, an individual plan that would meet the needs of each person. And when that plan was formulated um, for everybody who was living there, that isn't always everybody who's in a tent or structure. There are people there for community, people there um, engaged in economic activity, but for everybody who was living in that space, there was a plan that that person accepted and participated in um, designing the, the move um, from. And when everybody was gone to a destination that worked for them, they actually got there and um, they had helped to organize that departure. Then the site was cleaned up with a really quite, what evolved into a quite remarkable partnership with city um, departments, particularly parks. I really wanna shout out the incredible work that they did in, um, in partnership with our field teams. Um, and uh, that, is the sort of like outside looking in, that's what Just Care felt like. Um, we'll turn it over to Professor Beckett to talk about what that meant for individual trajectories. But one last word from me about where, where is, are things today? When COVID relief funding by and large played out in um, the spring of 2022, it was uncertain whether or not this work could continue. And um, to, with, with great, um, credit to both the city of Seattle, the um, mayor's office and council members who supported this. And then to the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, a plan was devised to essentially bifurcate co-lead so that half of it now lives in the city's public safety portfolio so that we can place individuals who are very impactful in various um, uh, vulnerable neighborhoods and highly um, impacted neighborhoods around the city and need to be housed in a housing first strategy to address behavioral health challenges and other issues. Um, and then half of COLEED belongs in um, the now in the Regional Homelessness Authority's um, portfolio of work that is responding to um, encampments on state transportation rights of way that is all funded uh, using state, um, the, the state funding pool for right of way response. And in that RHA, King County Regional Homelessness Authority right of way work, the just care style of field work um, continues on. So really the, the way that just cares encampment resolution strategy continues to be seen is over there in the RHA right of way response. Okay, handing the mic over to Professor Beckett. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Catherine Beckett. I'm on the faculty at the University of Washington in the departments of sociology and law societies and justice. And I'm just pulling up my slides um, to share with you. And someone told me the trick. Let's see, slideshow if it will start. Not sure how to get rid of that. Is this okay for folks or do I need to do something else? Can you all see the slides okay? Uh, we can see it. Um, Dr. Beckett, if you could um, uh, say play from start, I guess, I think it should probably go. fill it. Yeah, I think I, I can see that just fine. I think it's up on our screen in chambers, so okay. you can go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to name quickly that this report that I'll briefly summarize um, was a collaborative endeavor with Allison Goldberg and Marco Bridal Horwitz, who are in the PhD program in sociology at the University of Washington. Um, I will be giving just a brief overview of our key findings, um, but there are plenty more details in the report itself. Um, so this was essentially a follow up to a previous uh, more process oriented um, evaluation that we had done previously on the formation of Just Care as a response to the crisis induced by the intersection of homelessness and um, the, the pandemic. <clears throat> um, and this one is focused more on outcomes and specifically on housing outcomes as well as service related outcomes. We pulled together data from a variety of data sources that are listed here. Um, 
Thank you very much to uh, data analysts from PDA who are helpful in enabling us to access that information. We also went through case notes to kind of clear up ambiguous um, entries in the data system and conducted some interviews with key personnel to make sense of some of the things we were seeing and finding. So I will just jump in and some of this will be very um, unsurprising given what you've already heard from folks, but just to kind of put some numbers to the patterns that have already been described by people. Um, and, uh, and also if, if you ever see small discrepancy between the numbers that I'm showing and numbers that were presented earlier, it probably has to do with the time frame. Uh, we covered um, the period from September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2022, so a two year period. And we focused specifically on exits rather unless otherwise noted. So these are people who came in but also left. So it doesn't include people who were still in the program at the time we were collecting the data. Um, and what you can see here is just the demographics of who's participating in JustServe, who's served by it. And consistent with the data that Lisa talked through, we see that about two thirds, roughly just a little bit under two thirds of folks served by JustCare are uh, people of color, a little over one third are white, predominantly male, um, but a little less than one third female and a small share of non-binary and transgender folks. And then quite a very wide age range, 20 to 77 with an average range of 40. So that's kind of a demographic snapshot of who is served by Just Care. Um, also consistent with some of the themes that were mentioned earlier, we also found that many of the um, people served by Just Care would meet the definition of chronically uh, of people experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, nearly everyone, was 94%, had been living unsheltered for at least one year, and more than half, 57%, had been um, living unsheltered for more than five years. Um, Virtually everyone, so 99%, report that they had a mental health disorder or substance use disorder, and nearly two thirds reported that they were experiencing both of those things. And then finally, um, uh, a, a very large majority of Just Care participants um, report using drugs and often numerous drugs. Um, only 6% reported no substance use or just the use of marijuana. So, um, also consistent with some of the information that, that Lisa provided, um, the, the needs that people present with are, are numerous. Um, everybody reported needing housing support, but virtually everyone also identified other areas of, of need. And those were, I think, shown on Lisa's pink slide, um, just to put some details to that. Um, and um, we also found, and this is really drawn from the first report, we also found that the vast majority of encampment res residents were offered and did accept temporary lodging. And this is significant because again, it kind of counters the narrative that um, people who with behavioral health needs with criminal legal system involvement are service resistant in some way. And then finally, um, the, the need for services is high. And also we find that Just Care does in fact provide quite a few different kinds of services. And I've listed some of the, the key ones here um, for you to have a look at. Uh, I'm presenting these tables not in the order they appear in the report, so apologies for any um, confusion that that must create, but on the theme of service need and service receipt, um, we find that um, people are well served by uh, Just Care in terms of receiving various services, um, regardless of whether they ex what kind of situation they exit the program to. So even if someone does return to the streets, for example, they will ret re uh, return with um, having received a number of important services. So by the time of exit, we found that 89.6% met the definition of housing ready, meaning that they had um, acquired ID and, and um, put together the other administrative or addressed the other administrative requirements associated with uh, achieving or finding uh, permanent housing. The share that had healthcare insurance increased from about 40% or 41% upon entry to nearly 90% upon departure. And then we um, found that mo nearly all of the other uh, participants received a variety of other uh, services, including um, external medic medical care. Dr. Sin's team does a really um, a lot of work to connect people to the providers that they need, the specialists they need outside of Just Care, other kinds of external services that really uh, run the gamut, um, uh, including substance use treatment, but many other kinds of, of external treatments, family services, behavioral health treatment. 
other internal services which also run the gamut and are sort of listed in um, some in the notes below this table. So um, again, we find that this is a high need population and that many of those uh, needs are met um, during people's time in just care. If we turn our attention to housing, this is where we really see um, a kind of a, a break in over time. So with the service um, need and, and receipt, that is something that I think is consistent across time. Um, but the housing effort, uh, outcomes do vary quite a bit um, over time, which is consistent with some of the information that we heard earlier about the new arrangements with um, King County uh, RHA, for example. So um, what we did is we broke the cohort into two groups um, based on kind of a natural break that we saw in the data. So if you contrast uh, or look at the, the experiences of wave one versus wave two, um, you can see these different outcomes. So for the group that left before the end of February in 2022, 20% ended up in permanent uh, supportive housing or permanent housing, could be either a voucher or permanent supportive housing. 20% ended up in temporary housing of some sort and 51% um, ended up returning to homelessness. And that's very, very different in this latter period, the more recent period that starts, that runs from March 1st, 2022 through August 31st, 2022. And here we see that um, close to three fourths of the people exiting uh, just care transitional lodging were exiting to permanent housing of one of those two types that I mentioned, and far fewer were returning to homelessness. Um, I don't know if folks, it depends where your images of people are, um, but you might be able to see the final column on the right also shows that as a result of that shift, the number of the average number of people per month that just care is transitioning to permanent housing has increased um, very dramatically. Um, we wanted to see if these housing outcomes varied by race, gender, or age in any kind of meaningful way. And just to kind of cut to the chase, there is some variation, a little bit by race, a very little bit by gender, and, and then definitely some by age. So just to kind of put some details to that picture, what we found is that um, Black and Latinx uh, participants were most likely to exit to permanent housing. Uh, uh, white and multiracial uh, participants were slightly less like were less likely to exit to permanent housing, but we don't think this is a statistically significant difference. Um, the numbers also get kind of small in certain categories, so we want to be kind of cautious there. Um, not a huge gender difference, just a small gender difference. And then, but what we do really see is a pretty clear pattern where the older participants are far more likely to um, exit to permanent housing than the younger participants. We don't have a definitive answer to what's going on to explain that. We have some hypotheses we sort of um, put out in the report, and these include everything from perhaps older people are a little bit more tired and more motivated to work on these issues. Um, there are also possible, it's possible that some housing providers give priority to people who are have been on the streets for longer and or there are, are, and that's correlated with age. So there could be a number of factors at play there, but it's clear. Um, that there's just a little, there's mostly variation across age in terms of these housing outcomes. So to conclude, what we find is that, um, that the kind of harm reduction oriented transitional lodging that Just Care is providing can serve as an effective bridge to permanent housing for people with many vulnerabilities and challenges, but that that very much depends on the availability of those permanent housing resources. And that's again, the big shift that we've seen um, in the last year or so. Um, we also find that people who have been living unsheltered for extended periods of time and have many um, barriers to housing are not generally service or housing resistant. This is a population that can and should be served and, and housed. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions people may have. Uh, well, thank you so much for the panel and um, going over those findings. If we can go back, um, Dr. Beckett, and I know there will be some some questions from committee members um, to the slide deck, because uh, I might want to reference some individual slides. I have a couple questions, and I see Councilmember Herbold has questions. Uh, and I'm glad that this is our only agenda item today, so we can really spend some time getting into this. Um, if we could go to that second to last slide or the, the housing outcomes slide. Yes, this one. Um, I want to break down a little bit because I see that we don't break down the permanent housing to like permanent supportive housing or voucher supported private housing placements. 
I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that, because my understanding anecdotally is there's sort of an interesting mix uh, in exactly um, in wave two, what those placements were that might be instructive for some of our future planning around this work. Yes, I, I will say something briefly, but I think others probably are in a better position to put a lot of details in this. But my recollection is that this was predominantly permanent supportive housing, but there were a significant number of people who also received vouchers. However, through this period, I believe, Lisa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this was mainly folks housed in who exited to permanent supportive housing. Is that correct? Actually, on this panel, Crystal is the expert on this. So uh, a few seconds of warning, Crystal, that I'll, I'll uh, pass the baton to you. But you know, what was, um, what was noticeable about this period is that we had both, we had um, a, a brief moment in time to find out what would happen if uh, we took a pool of people and matched each person to their optimal um, housing resource. So it wasn't trying to you know, force people who really need the level of support that's available with permanent supportive housing into emergency housing vouchers where they have to live largely independently. And it also wasn't, importantly, forcing people who can live independently with um, light support into permanent supportive housing, which is more support that they need just because it happens to be the only um, place available at the moment. So we had um, the fascinating and um, all too rare experience of having a conversation about a finite group of people who needed to have a plan all at once that just going back to the spring of 2022 was when a number of the hotel based programs were coming to an end and RHA was asked to make sure that people didn't exit to the street. So working with the coordinated entry team at RHA, honestly, they asked us a question I don't think any of us had ever been asked, which was, well, if you could chart any road for, for each person on this list, what would be the right match? And stop worrying about, you know, what do you think we have? Like, what would be the right answer? And it turned out when we finished the rundown of the entire roster of people in just care facilities, who needed a place to go by the end of the spring 2022, um, not more than half needed permanent supportive housing and um, would find that to be the, the optimal match. And that does have ramifications in terms of cost per unit of housing resources that can be um, a good solution for a population that is chronically homeless. Crystal, do you wanna, we kind of famously called everybody back to have this discussion on a Friday at four o'clock when folks were headed to get their oil changed or on date night. And um, because we had never been given an opportunity to have that conversation before, I do wanna credit coordinated entry for the coordinated entry team at RHA for being extremely intentional about making changes in the way that they um, allocate the permanent housing resources that they had during that entire year to try to shift patterns of racial disparity that had emerged over time and been very persistent in permanent in the sorry in permanent housing uh, access and this conversation that they asked us to have with about this population was was a part of that turn um, crystal what light can you shed on how it ended up playing out with that mixed portfolio yeah so um that was a very interesting time um so yeah we had a mix of um participants that we were matching two emergency housing vouchers, like Lisa said, and then we had this other group that did not have necessarily, they, they were maybe more um, their needs that they had, you know, we had gone over with them or they had exhibited, we've observed in shelter, were more of like for permanent supportive housing or lighter, we call it like lighter permanent supportive housing, which is just maybe like case management services, not as intensive supports. Um, at housing. And so well, um, the King County Regional Homeless Authority um, coordinated entry um, and us, we had come together to come up with a way to strategize how to um, connect uh, our participants to permanent supportive housing resources. There was um, a Plymouth building that was coming open and um, 
all the rooms were going to be available. And so we, you know, went through our roster and did our best to um, make matches for that building. And then there were some other openings, but it was that direct um, partnership that we were able to have and build with um, KCRHA that really opened the doors for our folks to have that option, an additional option if they weren't a good fit for, um, you know, more independent living with the voucher as opposed to permanent housing. Did, did I hear though correctly that the that the split in that wave two was about 50-50, which was my original question? Yeah, that Between... was our that was our original um, allocation in the the plan when given the option to sort of have the right match for each um, for each of our current participants. And that's what's notable about that is that coming in the front door, almost everybody in our client population would have been participant population would have been thought to be a logical candidate for permanent supportive housing. Right. So so when I look at this wave two exits, the 70% to permanent supportive housing, half of that 70% was a voucher supported in a private placement approximately, and half was approximately permanent supportive housing. Those were the optimal matches that were designed. I will say the barriers to using the vouchers are very significant. So people who that would have been a good plan for them, some of those people ended up having to take permanent supportive housing um, options because the voucher utilization is just so, so challenging. Um, so I don't think it probably ended up being actually 50%. Uh, on both sides of that line, but it could have been. And I think that's the important in terms of the person's ability and characteristics that it could have been. So in terms of may, in terms of charting a course for somebody directly from the street, that um, sort of diagnostic process can look quite different than after people have been able to live in a secure location to identify what's really going on in their life, what their priorities are, and to work on barriers with a um, robust care team for some months. And that really does change the picture for a lot of our folks. So it well, it sounds like what you're saying is, is because of the services Just Care was providing, there was a surprisingly high voucher utilization rate, successful utilization yeah. rate relative to what might have been expected um, given the population. Exactly. Yeah, so it might not, ideally it would have been 50%, but it was probably something short of that. Do, 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 so yes. following so, up, we can follow up offline, but I would be really curious to know what the absolute breakdown was in terms of PSH versus voucher supported, because to the extent that we can figure out ways to use this model to be more um, effective at preparing people um, to be in a position where uh, they have the ability to pursue a voucher um, placement. I think that is an interesting takeaway from this that that I've been surprised by and would like to learn a little more about and um, talk to the team about what they might attribute that to. Uh, here, yeah, why I don't I... A, Go ahead. Just to, just to um, concur there, the, a strong theme from, from our work, our experience, and that of other providers that um, we've worked alongside over the past couple of years has been this, you know, theme of interest in a um, flexible, um, a deep, sustained voucher program, um, there really is room for that in the portfolio of, of permanent housing responses for this population. And I'm not sure that any of us would have projected that to be as true as it proved to be. Great. I, I have a few more questions, but I'm going to open it up to committee members. Uh, Councilmember Herbold. Uh, thanks. I have. Um, I, I also have a few different uh, questions relating to different slides. So maybe I'll just ask my questions related to this particular slide, and then I'll hold my questions. And maybe if you end up on the same slide <laughs> that I have questions on, I'll follow you then. Right? Well, Lisa, you, you just go ahead and ask, Councilmember Herbal. You should just go ahead and ask all your questions, um, okay. and and then uh, it, it, there's no one else in the queue yet, so um, okay. feel free to, right. well, to so use the floor. I, I will. Yeah. I will start with the questions related to the slide. So, um, what I'm hearing you say is that you're attributing these very large differences in uh, housing outcomes between waves one and two to this uh, coordination with RHA. Um, 
and um, just wanting to um, understand that to a little bit more detail. Um, I know that uh, coordinated, coordinated entry has historically been um, a barrier to um, serving the population of people that you are serving. And so does this mean um, that um, because of this coordination with RHA, leading you to be able to better access resources that care participants are receiving priority placements? At that time, yes, that's not a um, that's not an ongoing commitment that coordinated entries made to our program. If that makes sense, we were that spring. Um, the Executive Pacific Hotel was being um, sort of decommissioned as part of the city's shelter surge um, project, and another provider was operating that. Mm -hmm. um, we had our facilities, and there were a few others, and so. Um, so RHA and coordinated entry were sequentially working to make sure that those um, hoteling facilities did not come to an end and, and uh, have people just returning to the streets. So I think the different client populations, you know, tested coordinated entry in a different way. Ours tested coordinated entry, as you say, because this was not a population that, that um, in the past, because King County's coordinated entry process has prioritized vulnerability, mm -hmm. um, not chronic homelessness, not mm -hmm. um, barriers, and not exposure to other um, systems like the criminal legal system. So, uh, so, but they did. And I think that's the important part is that they fully embraced um, tackling this population and also the opportunity to learn. And so seeing that we had very strong um, when people were going to permanent supportive housing providers. So there was a receiving team, the um, you know report from those teams that people coming in from the co-lead program were very well supported. Um, that had happened very quickly. We rarely dropped uh, an available unit um, and you know failed to complete the match. Uh, all of that was just a really good experience and everybody was very you know open to taking that learning on board that this um, demonstration project if you will it happened to take place at a time when data had been um, you know circulating and made available about the pretty marked racial disparity in um, the population that was prioritized for permanent housing under those old criteria and under RHA's approach, they were trying different strategies. And so I think we, this demonstration project was one opportunity to um, really make some changes um, and, and find out you know, how that would work. And it did work very well. I really give them a ton of credit for leaning very far in, um, in a short period of time. And so moving forward, um, how, how do, <laughs> How do both approaches um, of prioritizing populations uh, live together side by side? I mean, so this is, this is editorial there, you know, it's, it's both so important, right? <laughs> right. I mean, the, the editorial comment um, after so many years of, you know, just listening to everyone believes that the population that they work with um, should be prioritized and one cannot prioritize all um, all circumstances or it's not a prioritization. But I do think that um, a braided, you know, obviously no one service provider can be prioritized or that just ends up um, working very badly and losing legitimacy. So it's not about that. It's that um, the, the model, the co-lead model, which, which, which is to begin with um, an approach that multiple organizations have helped to craft, um, it is replicable. And it uh, is reaching a population that has to be part of the prioritization stream. So the term that we use at PDA is braided prioritization. So that doesn't have to be the only column that reaches that, you know, the, the top of the ladder, but people in this column do have to reach the top of the ladder. And for many years, that was not the case because prioritizing, um, vulnerability tends to deprioritize people who are younger, 
um, and I don't mean young to Professor Beckett's point, um, the, this population was not super young, but it was not, it also was not super elderly. And so um, people who have a high impact in the community are exposed to the criminal legal system tend not to score um, super high on vulnerability indexes, but when left as a matter of public policy out in the streets have a very significant impact. So making sure that this, um, this population of people does have priority access to coordinated entry is absolutely critical if we want to see different impacts and different patterns and a reduction in the, the felt impact in our neighborhoods. And this cohort was just like the, the um, great example of how effectively that can be done if coordinated entry will allow this to be part of the prioritization pool. And so how, how is that next, like you have a good vision for um, how uh, you can have a braided prioritization approach. Um, it's been tried. Um, how do we take this proof of concept and um, ensure that the, the, the system that we use um, incorporates it moving, moving on? The coordinated entry system incorporates that, that approach moving forward. I mean, I'll just say very briefly that mm. coordinated entry is like it's a it's a shared public resource that for the region, and we have to apply all of the um, sorry, all of the learning. I'm in a hotel and somebody's ringing me. All of the learning from the past several years um, about the interconnectedness of systems to make sure that uh, people who are otherwise destined to their criminal legal system do get prioritized in coordinated entry. It's a very simple proposition, but it, it has never yet been achieved. So I think um, you know, city leaders, county leaders, um, and RHA leadership uh, in the five-year plan and in those conversations, this as a value and as a um, policy commitment, like the time is now. This was a, this was a takeaway from one table <laughs> for those who go back a few years. Um, it's been a takeaway from every serious study about the way in which homelessness and the criminal legal system intersect. Um, we have to embed access to permanent housing as part of the public safety strategy that the city and the county adopt. And um, I don't think that there's resistance to this at coordinated entry, but there are so many demands that it has to be public officials demand. Apologies for the interruption. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Lewis, um, if you have, I, I'm done with this slide. Should I go to on to a question on another slide? <laughs> um, yes, go ahead, Councilmember Herbold. I, I um, uh, well, no, I have one more for that slide, actually, just real briefly. Uh, what, under other outcomes, uh, which looks like it stayed fairly consistent regardless of the wave, um, what are some common examples of things that fall under the the percent other outcome is that like people reunited with family outside of jurisdiction kind of things or um, like I mean, what what's happening there I believe that there is, are additional details in the report and the note under this table but what I re recollect is that this included a few people died uh, a few people were incarcerated um, and I think one or two people disappeared if they went to move into with family or friends, we considered them to be temporarily housed. So they would show up in the temporary housing category. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, I'll hand it back over to you, Council Member Herbold. Thanks. Um, I think these, these next questions and a comment will be um, uh, more brief. On um, table one, the demographics uh, snapshot, um, the the note says that the data includes folks who exited um, care housing. It also include folks who are served by Just Care but not placed into housing. Um, and just wondering if, if, if it doesn't include it uh, that group of folks. Is there any reason to believe that the demographic profile would be different? So that's what's shown in this other table here, right? So we looked at how housing outcomes vary by race and by gender and by age. And so you can kind of get the answer to that question here. Um, and again, what we see is some interesting but not super 
uh, comprehensible variation by race, not, not a ton, but you know, for example, 58% of the Latinx participants exited to permanent housing, 36% of white folks, 44% uh, of black. We don't really have a theory about exactly why. I will say that in some of the smaller racial groups, the numbers are fairly small. So it's probably important not to fixate too much on, on those. Um, and again, with small gender differences, but mainly that the main difference in outcomes has to do with age. All right, and then um, on this table, and I think maybe you you, you may have addressed it, um, is there um, something else other than the small sample size um, to uh, have insights for, for why folks who identified as um, American Indian, Alaska Native, multiracial, and gender non-binary were um, more likely to return to homeless than others? Is that just the so small sample size or something you know, else? Really small sample sizes we've got here. Probably, for example, for the non-binary transgender, I believe we're talking about two individuals, right? Um, so I think it's it's it would be unwise to 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 fixate too much on those differences. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And then um, my last thing is uh, just a just a comment um, that um, thanks to the uh, careful. Um, I of Christina Kotsubos in my office, I wanted to just lift up because it's very, um, it's significant. Um, on table four, the service related outcomes, 41% um, of the participants um, had health insurance upon entry to trans care, and more than twice that figure, 89% had health care on exit. Um, just um, a really uh, incredible improvement for um, that group of folks um, who, as we as as have been reported, have a significant unmet need. No Thank comment. You, no, no question. Yeah. Just, a, just an observation of something very important. I agree. It's, it's very important. Yes. It, it speaks for itself and is incredibly impressive. Um, the, the housing ready statistics too, uh, um, probably to be more expected based based on the work than the than the health insurance, but um, uh, really impressive outcomes that I'm glad were tracked um, in this research. Uh, I just have a, a couple of additional questions, then I'm happy to open it up and see if committee members have any additional things to add. Um, do we have a good indication, maybe broken down by the waves on average stay? It seems like we have the data points where we could extrapolate that um, based on the uh, exits per month data mm -hmm. column. Yeah. Uh, but do, but average average stay per unit, uh, whether for the entire life of the program or broken down by wave would be an interesting thing to inquire over. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't believe we included those figures in the report itself, and I don't have precise numbers for you, but I do know we did look at it at some point, and I do know that the average length of stay has dropped markedly. People, and that it makes sense, right? There was no place for people to go in the in the first wave. And so they, you know, the people who could stay stayed for as long as they could. And um, um, whereas uh, now that there are these other options ready and available for people, case managers are able to work with them much more quickly and get them through much more quickly. I don't have the precise numbers for you. It might be something that we could produce if that would be helpful. Um, but at least I don't, or I don't know if you or others want to elaborate on that. Just that the length of stay in earlier, um, in the earlier portion of the program was largely <laughs> a function. I and mean, we had no idea how long we could keep this program even running, right? It was, we were getting month to month funding extensions. People were, not sure how long they could stay. Like Professor Beckett says, if they could um, tough that out, they would. But we were preparing people because there was no certainty about ongoing support for the possibility that they might need to um, exit to the street. That whole um, premise really changed when there was a public policy decision to have that not be the outcome and see you know, how well we could do um, if there was a channel to housing. So I don't think this is typical of, I think what you saw at the end is typical of how, you know, if we, if you use an approach like this intentionally as a community resource, you know, how could it go? It would go like it went at the end when there, <laughs> when uh, public officials did sort of claim this and we want this and we want um, to have it work as well as possible that is the arc um, of stay that, that one would see. 
Thank you. And I'm also interested in, particularly in wave two, we see this massive reduction in return to homelessness, and that can be attributable to the additional rapid rehousing and coordinated entry resources. Uh, I am curious about the 17.4% return to homelessness to the extent in wave two that you have a um, theory for uh, for that number, like for the reasons, it, it, just to for our information going forward and in what um, what it is about our programmatic offerings related to permanent supportive housing and the voucher supported placements that um, clearly there's still a significant gap for a a significant cohort of um of folks as that number represents uh, but if there's any commentary on the things that could close that gap and close that number more it may be that dr katarski will want to comment on this but this is really um when i said earlier that there are people whom we took on um despite that when we designed co-lead, we knew that, um, and, and frankly, when we designed Just Care, which had an array of um, shelter lodging uh, case management partners, we had a gap for people with severe mental illness. And we just, um, there were individuals, even during this time, who were needs exceeds to the kind of care and support that we could provide in co-lead. We couldn't safely um, uh, maintain some people in our community lodging not congregate lodging, but it is community lodging. We have staff on site and we have, a, we have many other participants who need, who whose safety we're responsible for. So there are some people that we just couldn't maintain for the months needed to make a transition to permanent housing. And I will say they are also needs exceeds most of the permanent housing options that exist out there as well. We don't have, and we, we had an, uh, our most recent experience of this last week, very heartbreaking situation. We don't have a good solution for people who, um, because of psychosis or other mental illness, threaten the safety and security of other people and themselves are very vulnerable and um, need care and support. That is not a crisis situation. It's a, a situation of chronic, unsupported, um, you know, people living unsupported, very mentally ill, um, who need a, a housing solution. So why, why I say it's not crisis, it's not something that like crisis centers fill the gap for. And our civil commitment um, system, which ideally we would be able to access civil commitment and somebody maybe even would be able to come back to us or other residential um, stay alternatives is, not, is really not accessible to programs like ours um, and participants like ours. So individuals are released to homelessness because we can't keep some people safely and there is nowhere, there is no other piece of our system that's designed to, re to receive such individuals. It's truly heartbreaking. And Lisa, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna see here if there's other colleagues um, who are looking to be recognized. Uh, um, I don't see any additional questions. Um, I really appreciate that we were able to spend a, a lot of time on this agenda item today, go through this report. Um, I appreciate the submittal of the physical report and definitely encourage members of the public and members of the media who might be watching to take advantage of um, that information that that is now generally and broadly available. Uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about... Um, uh, my personal gratitude and the gratitude of a lot of my constituents um, in the central core constituents of, you know, of district seven, but also district one um, and district two who have been in the catchment area that um, just care has been operational in, in terms of when things were really bad and were at their worst, this is a team that really stood up and came into the void and worked to make a program bespoke to the problem our community was facing and needed to fix. And we've learned a lot from it. We were able to do a lot of good. And there's a lot of lessons here that 
um, have some scalability attached to them and, and things that we can replicate to continue making progress on these issues. Uh, and then also some things that we've identified that despite our best intentions and our best um, attempts to close the gap, uh, we're still just not there yet. Uh, as um, uh, Lisa Dugard just indicated, um, especially in regards to um, very high acuity behavioral mental health needs. So, you know, I'm committed to continuing with this work uh, with all the people here and the King County Regional Homelessness Authority and some of our other partners and uh, really appreciate the transparency, the continued um, commitment to data reporting and internal evaluation to um, have a culture of constant improvement um, in these programs that we're doing together. Uh, and a lot of these results speak for themselves. I mean, we looked at that map of where there used to be encampments and uh, there's whole communities of folks who have been able to receive access to care and good housing outcomes that wouldn't have been available but for the work of the people here. And I'm really, really grateful for that. And I know that um, a lot of people in the city uh, who um, who live or have businesses around the sites of those encampments are also grateful. So uh, it's a real testament to, to the strength of your model and your commitment to this work. And um, I really appreciate it. Um, are there any other comments before we close out this agenda item and then close out uh, the committee? I don't see any. Um, as I stated earlier, colleagues, this was our only agenda item. Um, and seeing nothing for the good of the order, uh, it is now 3.41 p.m. And I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Um, thank you all for your participation. And everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.